This Week on Crossfeed. The Atheist Narnia. Another belief poll. Can a man be a pastor if he used to be a woman? Saudi Arabia and religious freedom. And what does religion have to do with health care? Welcome, everybody. I am Pastor Jim Butler, slightly grizzled out here at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. And I am Pastor Dale Christley, Pastor St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry about the uh, unscheduled week off. Uh, something that I should have known about came up. And... That's okay. And this way, everybody can see me kind of half bearded instead of just beginning to. It's <laughs> going to be a cold winter, so you know the caterpillar is getting you know all 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 you know woolied up here. Wrap it up, fuzzball. Well, I've been fighting a cold all week. I'm so a little stuffy, so uh, if I sound kind of odd, more so than usual, that's why. I was going to say, who's going to notice? <laughs> but, uh, hope you've had a good uh, November out there so far. Yeah, there he goes, coughing, folks. Yeah. Be thankful for the mute button. The key to faking out the parents is the clammy hands. I do. Um, it's. I've just been so busy. Things are finally settling down a little bit, but it's like. As soon as you think that things are going to calm down a little bit, then something else pops up. So it's been kind of nonstop. We have a new secretary, and she's not a member of the church. And she was asking me, um, middle of July, she goes, What is the slowdown you told me about? <laughs> <laughs> I think we saw it for a week in August, and that's about it. I need to apologize. Uh, if you're listening, you might hear an echo of my voice. I don't know what the cause of that is today. I seem, now it's not there, but it seems to kind of come and go. So we'll have to find out what happens. Well, where should we begin tonight? Once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. Well, let's be- how we prepare for this. Yeah, well, let's begin with the golden compass. Hey, man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. Now, Have you read it? I've read, I've not read the book, no. Okay. Uh, I read the yeah. article and I saw the trailer on Apple Trailers. But that's about all I've got into. But uh, uh, apparently this, uh, I've gotten a lot of emails on this. I'll say that uh, from a lot of yeah, different groups. So Oh, I touched it! I touched it! Ah! No! No! Apparently, this uh, yeah, calling yeah, you know, which I never think is a good idea. But uh, uh, his Dark Materials is the name of the trilogy, and it's by Philip Pullman, who is an outspoken atheist. That's uh, one of the things about him, I guess. And the, the the first two books aren't too revealing, but the third book. Uh, Apparently they find God and kill him, although they find out that God really isn't God. Um, but it's gotten a lot of people very upset. Um, you know, he—I mean, he—he he admits flatly that he is an outspoken atheist. He um, absolutely despises the Narnia series. Yeah, I love this quote. He says, "I loathe the Narnia books. Uh, I hate them with a deep and bitter passion." with their view of childhood as a golden age from which sexuality and adulthood are falling away. He's called the series one of the most ugly and poisonous things he's ever read. Wow. I've never seen somebody so... <laughs> Last time I saw somebody so bitter about a book series, it was the Harry Potter series. <laughs> I think we had a bad influence on her. So, well, yeah. I... He seems angry, but... Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. <laughs> The um, the sort of twist in all of this is that uh, New Line Cinema is, is putting this out, making a movie out of it. They've been working on it since 2004. And while they're making a movie based on this book, and there are 
anti-Christian or, or, or actually really anti-religious, anti-church um, kind of concepts in all the books. They're pulling all of that information, all of, all of that anti-church stuff out of it so that um, you know, they're kind of gutting the book and in order to produce a movie that's not going to offend Christians. Right. But that is offending Christians because they're saying this isn't in the book, movie, but the kids are going to go out and buy the book and then it's going to be there. We're in trouble. Um, you so, can't win, can you? Yeah, I guess you can't win. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, interestingly enough, it, is that um, uh, the Christian film and television commercial by Ted Bear, uh, Jimmy Dobson's Focus on the Family, they're both saying they're you know kind of taking a wait and see attitude about it. Um, uh, Alto Bear says uh, he's got plenty of things to say about the the, 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 the the book. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. And they actually put out a pamphlet about the book, the book about the series, but they don't really say too much about the, the, the movie itself. Um, interesting enough, by the way, they, they've kind of cleaned out the, the anti-God parts. Um, the writer of the book, Phil Pullman, co-wrote the screenplay. Right. Yeah. So he, you know, he's he's on board with this whole remove the anti god stuff. Right. And he's real comfortable with it. Yeah, I like his quote. This must be the only film attacked in the same week for being too religious and for being anti-religious by people who haven't even seen the movie. <laughs> it's true. Oh, good grief! I know. I, you know, this is one of those things. If you consider. I mean, there have been plenty of movies out there. Well, let's face it. Most of the movies out there have stuff that's anti-Christian in some way or another. So, um, you know, you, you look at this and you think, well, okay, this is a little more explicit about it, but then it gets rid of the stuff that's explicit about it, so it's not anti-Christian anymore. I, mean, I think it's a good thing to inform people, well, okay, just be aware that the book is really different from the movie. Of course, the book's always really from different from movies, so that's no big surprise. I mean, you compare the Harry Potter books with the movies, and, well, they tried to be faithful, but, I mean, realistically. Yeah, the, they made their changes. Also, now, I mean, I watched the trailer online today. I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. It looks very confusing to me. I have no idea what that meant. Yeah, so. But it looks like it's got a great cast. Nicole Kidman and Sam Elliott and uh, Daniel Craig. Uh, not playing James Bond this time. Uh, but it's some fantasy world where she, where, where there's these uh, animal spirit creatures that talk to you. And I'm, I was very confused trying to watch it. But uh, so maybe now I'm intrigued enough to so maybe I'll go out and pick up the book and, you know, read and see what it's like. Well, that's the thing. Now I'm kind of intrigued by the book. You know, I'm, oh, gee, what do we do with it? You know, it, it's sort of just, you know, not having read the book. And, and if you ever heard of the play uh, Waiting for Godot? I've read it several times. Okay. See, this this kind of seems to, it kind of reminds me of that. Uh? The sort of, well, is it, you know, is it God? Or the kind of looking for God or whatever, and then... He's not there. So. And never should, Godot never shows up. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I think that there's probably worse things to be up in arms about. Um, I, I think, you know, if anything, we should be thankful, especially for a movie that if they're planning to release it around Christmas, that they took the anti-Christian stuff out of it. I think it's great because, you know, people are going to go see it regardless. So... And what would be interesting to me is if it makes a difference in the book sales. I mean, Harry Potter was a huge phenomenon. You know, the, the, the books drove the movie in that case. You know, some right. people are concerned that the, you know, the, the, the movie is going to be driving the book. Um, but I, I wonder if that's going to be true or not. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, because unless there's a lot of hype about the books, which now this is going to give the books some hype, but then at least people know what they're um, what they're getting into 
And so, I, you know, it's good for people to know. I mean, how many books, how many movies have you read that are based on books where you watched the movie and then went out and bought the book afterward? Generally, I try to, if I'm going to see it based on a book, I try to read the book first. Yep. Um, it's, it's generally a rule in our house that if we're going to watch a movie based on a book, we're all going to read the book first. Mm-hmm. Um, then, you know, then you run into the annoying thing of uh, one of the kids going, oh, that's different, that's different. Or, or else I should be doing that. <laughs> so, I, know, I, I think if you want to go see the movie, I don't think that you should have any, uh, you know, conscious problems uh, seeing it. Um, you know, it's not like there's not plenty of other atheists in Hollywood that you'd be giving your money to by going to a different movie. So, um, as far as as anybody else, um, you know, if you want to read the book, read the book. I, uh, I, I find those things really challenging. I think they're good. They're good exercise in faith. Um, if you're you're strong in your faith and you can read that stuff, and, you know, face the challenge and you know keep a Bible handy and um, you know if, if you find yourself sort of in doubt, well, for one, don't be surprised because uh, that's the reality of being a sinner in the sinful world. But also, it's a matter of um, you know this is it's a good chance when you, when you have those those questions. That's going to help strengthen your faith because it's going to Leave you running back to the Bible and to um, to find the answers, and you know, that's how the church has grown historically is by being challenged. So I think it's a good exercise as long as you're you know you're strong, and also it's good to have a community around you, your you know, your pastor, your congregation, um, and that people that if you have questions, if, if some of this mm-hmm. stuff is just a little bit too much of a challenge for you, but gee, I don't know how to answer this. You know, to have somebody to fall back on to say, boy, how would you answer this? You know, how, how do I answer this? So that would be helpful too. A couple good thoughts there. Speaking of uh, how would you answer things, how would you, what do you believe, I I thought this survey was kind of interesting. That yeah. uh, basically the majority of Americans are pretty fundamentalist in their faith. Uh, yeah. uh, this is... Uh, uh, or maybe biblical in their faith. Um, yeah, it's kind of uh, The Barna Group, uh, George Barna's um, going out doing survey group there, did some things and asked people what do they really literally believe. And yeah, um, 75% said that they, this is of Americans, not necessarily churchgoers only, but 75% of the Americans said that Jesus bodily rose from the dead. Um, interestingly enough, 75% of Americans who do not identify themselves as born-again Christians said that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, 68% um, of college graduates said that they believe the resurrection is true. Um, and... Um, most of them, two-thirds, uh, believe that Moses is part of the Red Sea. Um, something like... Do you believe that Daniel survived in the lion's den? Yeah. And uh, David really fought Goliath? Now, interestingly, as you look at these numbers, you sort of look at Americans as a whole, and then they sort of break it down. Generally, the mainline Protestants were around 10% lower. And by mainline Protestants, they actually define it in here for a change. Um, They are... The American Baptist, United Church of Christ, Episcopal, United Methodist, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and Presbyterian Church USA. Yeah. So... And those are typically the most, um, some of the most liberal uh, denominations. Well, definitely United Church of Christ, the Episcopalians, the United Methodists. We're in trouble. Um, and I don't know about the American Baptists. Baptists are fun. Four, three Baptists, you get four opinions. So, you know, it really depends who you talk to. But 
within the United Church of Christ, I mean, you are definitely uh, dealing there. That, that I think that would bring down the numbers considerably, depending on how many of them were associated with the UCC. Right. Uh, yeah, so, and then Roman Catholics were also uh, lower, tended to be, uh, actually most of these tended to be slightly lower than the mainline Protestants, which I thought was interesting. They were in trouble. Because Roman Catholicism um, official teachings are pretty conservative overall. Um, well, the one exception would probably be uh, creation. Uh, 73%. This is interesting. Um, all right. Concentrate, Pinky. Concentrate. 60% of adults believe that God created the universe in six days. I'm talking literal 24 hour days. Um, the more highly educated Americans were much less likely to believe the creation of hell is literally true. 73% of adults who did not attend college believe the story is literally accurate. Only 38% of college graduates hold that view. 74% of Protestants have a literal interpretation of creation compared to only 50% of Catholics. And actually, that didn't surprise me at all because the Pope, what was it, 10, 20 years ago, uh, came out and said that he didn't hold to a literal creation view. So if the Pope doesn't, why would, I mean, why would everybody else, or why would other Roman Catholics? Oh, very nice, Blaine! But... And blacks are most likely to interpret biblical stories as literal truth. So what I thought was the key thing, which I agreed, is these... Again, I apologize for that feedback. It's driving me crazy. Is that he also points... Barnard also points out that while millions believe these stories are literally true, it doesn't seem to have much difference in the impact of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one time doing some evangelism. And I remember talking to this one woman and asking her, what do you believe about Jesus? And I mean, she gave perfectly orthodox answers. Jesus is the Son of God. He was born of a virgin. He died and rose again. And I asked her, so why do you think you're going to heaven? Because I've been a really good person. <laughs> and I was sitting there yeah. going, what, what, isn't, what isn't connecting there? You know, if you're, if you're being this really good, why did Jesus have to die? You know, what does that have to do with anything? And I think, you know, here again, we're almost dealing kind of sort of the same thing. How does this, you know, I believe all this. How does this apply to my life? Oh, no. Does it? You know, and... and yeah. You know, even the demons believe this stuff. Right. They tremble. So, the, and, you know, that also, it's, it draws an important distinction between knowledge and faith. It's one thing to believe in the historicity of it. It's something else to believe that it was for me. I remember, and I may have told the story before, there used to be this great video called What is God Like? And they went around to England, Chicago, I think Australia, a couple other places. And they just asked people on the street, what is God like? And um, this one woman from England, she said, well, you know, if you believe in God, everything in your life has to be affected by that. If you believe in God, it really has to stand at the very center of your life. And it's not like you can have a work life and a, and a home life and a, a, a God life. God's got to be in everything that you do. And, and you've got to be totally committed to that and everything that, that you're about. But I'm not ready to make a commitment like that. So I don't believe in God. Wow. So <laughs> <laughs> that is. Yeah. That hits at the core of um, why so many people are unwilling to to admit it. Yeah. Oh, gee. <laughs> If I admit that there's a God, then I have to admit that I'm accountable to him. And if I have to admit that I'm accountable to him, then then I have to, you know, I have to really take an honest look at my life and say how well have I done. And then I have to come to terms with my own sin. And, um, you know, of course there's the cross, but then there's that whole idea that 
I can't do it on my own. Right. That I'm completely dependent on somebody else to save me. Damn, that, that doesn't sit well with my ego. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. <laughs> I always thought it was interesting how honest she was, though. I've used that illustration in sermons a couple times. Unfortunately, I can't find that video anywhere anymore. Right. Three season confirmation every year. So if any of you out there have seen that, you know where to find it, let us know. Yes. It's by White Lion Pictograph, which unfortunately is out of business. Okay. So. eBay. Yeah, eBay somewhere. Right? So, but it was, it was a good video. Unfortunately, it'd be actually be on video. It wouldn't be on DVD. Uh, so, yeah. But we have a video cassette player here, so I could still use it. But. Yeah, I, I wondered, though, why such a, a lower number of Catholics believed and took this literally. But then, you know... Depending where you are, at least out here, there's a lot of um, cultural Catholics. Don't get technical with me. Yeah. You know, people who never go to church, never go to confession, never do anything, but they are Catholic. My yeah. wife has a woman there at her office, and the woman never goes to church. Never does anything. But when her son went on his uh, 55-hour uh, Marine uh, victory camp thing at the end of his boot camp, she burned a candle for 55 hours for him. She had one going all the time. Yeah. And we were just kind of like, gee, those must have been interesting prayers. Hi, God, remember me? I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah. Well, you know... Sometimes it seems like a lot of, and I, you know, we're we're not speaking for all Roman Catholics, obviously, here. Um, but there was just a, a news story, and it was actually on our local news about, you know, with all the the housing crisis and everything, all the people that are burying the Joseph statues upside down in the yard trying to sell houses. You've heard of that, right? No, uh-uh. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah I have, yeah. You, you do that and you'll sell your house within, what, 48 hours or something like that. Right. And, uh, so, and, you know, I, I've always wanted to kind of go do a little digging in our yard. <laughs> Although I think, actually, where our house is, uh, it used to be a Methodist church, so there's probably not a Joseph statue buried in the yard. I find your lack of faith disturbing. But, um, but you know, there's a lot of that, that kind of superstition. The the um the sort of following these practices. Yeah, I've got a Saint Christopher medal hanging in my car, and you know, and, and uh, um, maybe there's a, a picture of Mary or a statue or something like that hanging somewhere. And, um, you know, but as far as like, what does this actually mean to my life? Well, you know, it's more of a um, if I need something right now, then I'll use one of my magic charms. But, and really, Catholics are the only ones to do that, either by any means. Um, you know, how many people uh, wear a cross necklace as a lucky child? Or uh, put a, a fish emblem on the back of your car to protect you from speeding tickets or something. Jesus decal does quite a trick. Right above my dashboard, I stick it. A good luck charm. It keeps me from harm. Saves me from I cannot find, uh, unfortunately, um, What is God Like by White Lion Pictograph, but I did find, they actually have a, a website now, which they didn't have last time I hunted them down. Um, and absolutely, it's whitelionpictograph.com. Uh, if you want to go, if you want to see an absolutely wonderful video, um, they have one called The Music Box. And if you've never seen this with the, with the, um, uh, what was the, what the, the sensational nightingales is uh, the guys who, who who sing in it. It's a riot and it's really ideal um, for a class on evangelism to watch this. But you have these guys in these little white tuxes with little wings on the back and stuff. And uh, it's a really neat, uh, very, very neat uh, little little movie. So. 
Ah, let's move on here. Uh, well, let's see. Well, we talked about what these different religious groups believe, and we talked about one of the pro mainline Protestants was the United Methodists. So let's go talk about the fun the United Methodists are having. You know, Lyle Schaller is a United Methodist. Schaller was a um, uh, uh, church growth guy, church consultant. I think he's still around. He used to uh, be part of uh, the Yoke Fellow Institute. And he used to put out um, this thing called um, the Leadership Letter or something like that. Um, oh, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he had a little Friar Tuck illustrations, and he published several books. And He was rather good. I actually got the... Anyway, I get to see him speak shortly before his retirement. And he looks at me and this other guy who graduated a couple years ahead of me, and he goes, you know, I'm glad I'm retiring. Because you're going to be facing issues in ministry. I never even dreamed of. I think this might be one of them. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have um, the Reverend Drew Phoenix, um, uh, formerly known as Reverend Ann Gordon. So you get it, Ann, Andrew, Drew. Okay. And, of course, Phoenix being a symbol of resurrection or, you know, new life. Um, she got the operation, and uh, she avoided that whole women's ordination question. <laughs> well, she was ordained before. As yeah, a, she was. Uh, but now it's okay because she's a Muslim. Um, this is going to be an interesting situation. Um, on the one hand... This, his church, St. John's Methodist Church in Baltimore, uh, he's a fun-loving pastor who counsels, takes their kids hiking, explains scriptures, plunges in worldly causes. <laughs> to the conservatives, he's a rebel who has defied God and nature should be removed from the ministry. <laughs> there is evil there that does not sleep. Yeah. And, and by the way, just um, so that you're not uh, left in the dark, uh, the decision was made. And oh! I, yeah. It was in the comment. Um, let's take a look at um, that he, she is a pastor in good standing and uh, therefore appointable. So it was uh, released on Tuesday by the church's judicial council. So, but in Permian, the council left aside the specific question of whether transgender people can serve. What mattered here is that she faced no administrative or judicial action beyond the question of the name change itself. The Judicial Council, council does not reach the question of whether gender change is a chargeable offense or violates minimum standards established by the General Conference. In other words, they said, we're not going to do anything about it, and we're going to leave it up to somebody else to make the decision. Well, I think... I there's technically no rule against a transgendered, sex-changed person not to be a pastor in the United Methodist Church. He's just like, you know, guess what, folks? It's not against the rules. I'm not gay yeah, living yeah. in a, you know, partnered relationship. There, you can fire me for that. Um, I'm not this, and you can fire me for that. But there's no rule against this. Yeah, there's no rule against Klingon serving. Either. <laughs> yeah, you know, so he he kind of worked around it. And and hey, the, I the, I think their viewpoint is since there's nothing explicitly against it, we're not going to make make laws sitting here. We're not going to make a rule for the church when the church hasn't spoken here. Which, and, you know, it's really complicated because the sort of society's understanding of a transgender versus homosexual, it's, it's really seen as two very different things. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, the Bible lumps it all together. Um, and basically says, all right, God made man in his image. He made woman for man. You know, there's a very 
just uh, delineation there uh, throughout Scripture. And uh, I, I, there's this, this quote from a um, character, a social worker and lifelong Methodist. It was like, okay, great, congratulations. You're living as God intended now. How wonderful. Every now and then people struggle with the pronouns. That's the biggest challenge. Right. Living as God intended. So that raises the question. Did God go, oh, whoops, long trouble was over. That it is you who are mistaken. Or, what? <laughs> or, I like that this guy, he says, those who argue God doesn't make mistakes and don't mess with creation. Well, they use medical procedures to change their bodies. Think of all the vaccinations, medications, and pharmaceuticals we take. They completely, we completely alter our bodies. Uh? And I'm just like, I, I, I don't know, but the, there's a difference between, okay, shout out to my son Josh, who called me last night feeling very sick. He's been taking smallpox, anthrax, and a couple other uh, vaccines to get ready to go to Iraq here in about two or three weeks. Now, there's a difference between getting the smallpox and anthrax vaccine and him calling me and saying, by the way, call me Joan. <laughs> <laughs> now that's comedy. You know, there's a slight yeah. difference there. Yeah, and you know, and there was, I saw a comment about this, and they, they said, well, you know, name change. Name change is the way to Paul, change the name to Paul, and, you know, you have Simon, Peter, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, but the name change signifies something completely different here. You know, it's, it's not just a, a change in, in identity, it's, it's a change in your biology. Um, and, you know, not, not just... Uh, it's just immediate. I mean, this is really saying, all right, God, I'm not real happy with um, with what you made me to be. And so I'm going to take matters into my own hands and change myself um, to be what I want to be, regardless of what you have to say about it. Hey, man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. Yeah, it's... Oh, some of these things. Um, well, what I think is kind of interesting, too, is he's talking about um, this church, the St. John's Church. I don't know how they afford him as a pastor. Or, yeah, or they said, you know, when, when he started five years ago, eight people showed up for Sunday worship. Now 40 do. Um, I don't know how in the world would... He's got to be part-time. Or something, I don't know. But uh, it's... Uh, I don't know. It depends. You know, we, depending on the time of year, our, our numbers can slip down into the 50s um, as far as an average. Yeah, but you don't have eight. No. And, uh, yes, I'm, I'm not sure how that works. Um, the other thing here that gets me is uh, <laughs> a number of Methodist theologian and ethicists asked to comment for this article declined. A lot of them didn't want to get 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 into this. I mean, yeah, yeah this. Uh, personally, I would have less trouble with a celibate gay person being ordained than I would with this transgendered thing. This this strikes me as a little bit. Again, this, how did God create me? But we we also got this a few a little bit a few uh, months ago with the um, one teacher at the Christian college. Yep. And, with, yep. you know, but but he wasn't yep. going all the way, but he was doing the dressing in the uh, in the feminine clothes and everything. Yep. It'd be... I've never met someone who, you know, was felt, you know, deep down I know I'm really male or deep down I know I'm really female. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and never really... It's a strange... Interesting issue to deal with, an interesting issue to, to, to sit there and talk with people on. But you know, how has God created us? Well, and as soon as we say there's nothing wrong with it, then all of a sudden 
there's no longer any chance of counseling or treatment or anything like that for it. The treatment is to get into it. And that just doesn't seem happy to me. Right. The, 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 the treatment is to say this is okay. Right. So. so but, you know, that's the Bible talks about there are those who call evil good and good evil and, you know. And they will hear what they want their itching ears to hear. Yep. So, it's hard, you know, it's hard to say anything and, and really be heard because when you can kind of pick and choose what you want to hear and just slow the rest or um, justify it, explain it away, whatever. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And it's self-justification. Right. You know, I mean, the, the whole point of Christianity is that we we'll find ourselves dealing with our own sin. Uh, whether, you know, dealing with temptation and all that kind of stuff. Instead of giving into it, we take it to the cross and say, Jesus, forgive me for this. I'm, you know, I'm struggling here. Um, but it's, you know, the first step is confession of that sin. And once he confesses the sin, then we forgive him. But he you puts yourself in a very dangerous situation when you don't confess that sin, but rather embrace it. It's not healthy, not only to the mind, but to the soul. Isn't it interesting, too, that the people who are struggling with this are the Methodists, who are traditionally holiness. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side. Yeah, and I'll, uh, Can you imagine what John Wesley would have thought of this? You need the second blessing. <laughs> so speaking of, okay. Okay, let's go over there. Um, there's a, a new study that's been done that shows that religion and spirituality are linked to positive physical and mental health. Surprise. However, most studies have focused on people with life-threatening diseases. A new study from the University of Missouri, Columbia, shows that religion helps many individuals with disabilities adjust to their impairments and gives new meaning to their lives. They say religion is a coping mechanism for persons with chronic disabilities such as a traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, stroke, and arthritis. That doesn't surprise me. I know plenty of people that suffer from these things that say, I don't know how I can get through this by myself, how I can get through this without God, without knowing I have the resurrection to look forward to. Right. Or, I remember one girl when I was in college, and she was dealing with some kind of chronic condition. I can't remember exactly what it was. Bright girl. But uh, she she held to the verse, um, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. That was, that was her. She told us that again and again. That, you know, she held to God's strength to get her through every single day. Yeah, so to me this makes perfect, absolute perfect sense. And uh, then it says... Uh, you know, that uh, persons facing impending death may use religion to help them accept their condition, come to terms with unresolved life issues, and prepare for death. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, gee, I don't know. Well, let's see, I'm going to die. Um, God has promised resurrection. That's a pretty good cure. It gives, it gives purpose and meaning and hope and those kinds of good things. Although it's interesting, uh, this was not specifically Christian, um, you know, because it talks about healthcare providers should encourage religious practices, important visuals such as yoga, uh, reading of religious texts, meditation, or laying on of hands. Yeah, so it's taking almost a sort of a clinical approach, right? Hmm. And you know, you see these studies on like prayer. What's the effect of, of prayer? Uh, praying to someone and, mm. <clears throat> and it's up. When you try to examine God uh, scientifically, it doesn't work. Okay. Well, uh, it, it, generally they get the exact opposite uh, results than what they're expecting in that. 
And, you know, here they're going, well, let's see, maybe yoga will work. Maybe, you know, they're, they're treating these like alternative medicine. Like, we'll, we'll throw laying out of hands in there with acupuncture and uh, herbal remedies or something. Also, I mean, to a certain extent, uh, Victor Frankl's book, um, Man's Search for Meaning. You know, now he was a Jewish person. He was not Christian. But, you know, every time you turn that off, my echoing comes back. Okay. Yeah. So you don't want me talking about No, I guess not. So I get, instead they get to listen to me echo. They get to listen to me twice in the same time. <laughs> anyway. That's what everybody wants. Yeah. <laughs> Bored me. I'm going to marry that man. Anyway, uh, Frankel's book, The Man's Search for Meaning, he, he was not Christian. He was, you know, a Jewish doctor in the concentration camp. But his faith in God got him through. And he said other people he knows who had a religious faith, you know, of whatever kind, tended to get them through. And I, I read uh, a book by a guy who was uh, one of the soldiers on the on soldiers sailors on the USS Pueblo when that was you know captured in the 50s and he was he was an evangelical christian but he said others were on there um one was jewish one was a christian scientist one was a jehovah's witness and you know they relied on their faith to get them through and even though then you know they weren't necessarily christian um having a faith i think is very important and does guide people through. And that's one thing that, you know, military chaplains learn then is, you know, how to work with people who have a different faith than they do. But realize that 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 that, that having that being a person of faith, having some sort of relationship with a, a religion can make a big difference in people's lives. You and I, of course, would say the real truth is in the cross and in the open tomb, and that's where real hope lies. Yeah. Yeah. No. The other things are just a shadow or corruption of the, the true reality. But there is something just the kind of the general clinical approach, too. Yeah. There's also the other side of the coin. It's very important that rehabilitation professionals be aware of the different religious customs which should be considered when evaluating a treating patient, including information regarding the appropriateness of physical touching by others, preferences regarding gender-specific services, dress, and hygiene customs. Well, that makes a, a huge difference, in, um, especially with people with uh, specific rules about uh, how they can dress and um, what's appropriate for, you know, if, if you're a part of a religion where um, it's not appropriate to have any kind of physical contact with someone of the opposite sex that you're not married to or something like that, you know, and then you get into these therapy situations where the person's holding you up or, you know, or whatever, um, you know, that can, that can cause a lot of, uh, you know, emotional and psychological stress for that person because, oh, this shouldn't be happening, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Or, um, I don't know if you read any of the articles when Laura Bush was over in Saudi Arabia trying to raise awareness on breast cancer. And, you know, one of the problems is it's taboo for women to visit male doctors. This is madness. And it's taboo for women to become doctors. When will this insanity end? That's a problem. And also, you know, you, and so they can't really again, talk about um, talk about this, and, and, and the men aren't allowed to touch the women to, you know, see if they indeed have a growth on a breast or something, and it's just causing horrible problems over there, and women are dying needlessly. Do we let them stand alone? So, you know, I, I know Luther, I think it's at his large catechism somewhere, says, you know, um, doctors can get away with touching places where you slap somebody else for, you know, but that's it all, the, the, the role of the doctor. You know, and then he, he replies yeah. that somehow to God. I can't remember the exact quote, but, you know, it's they haven't figured that out over there apparently yet. Well, you know, the, the other thing is, if you talk to um, any woman that I've ever talked to that had to go to a gynecologist or something, it wasn't the sort of experience that they really are interested in repeating anytime soon, usually. Oh, no.
but uh, there, there was one other thing in here that, that caught my attention. It said, praying with patients may be appropriate in some cases, according to the study. Rehabilitation psychologists, counselors, and chaplains also should work together to initiate forgiveness interventions. Patients who are injured as a result of the actions of others may be better able to work toward recovery if they can use their religious beliefs to work through emotions surrounding the cause of the disability. And this is something we've talked about before. It's something that the church can specifically offer that nobody else can, and that's forgiveness. Um, not only teaching them to, to forgive those who brought them into the situation, um, but also to teach them that they are forgiven for any part that they may have played in their current um, situation. And, you know, that's something that doctors are trained to do, that, you know, uh, nursing staff or whatever. But it's something that the church does have to offer. It's also something that we almost have to teach people to do. Uh, I was reading a most recent issue of Lutheran Forum, and they had an article in there by a uh, young woman who's attending an ELCA seminary, and the ELCA requires all students to undergo uh, clinical pastoral education, CPE. And, you know, one of the things she's, she's was shocked by in this is that you know, there is this discouragement to pray. There's this there's discouragement of reading scripture. There's discouragement, and it's this big thing on ministry of presence. You just be there. You don't need to pray with the person. You don't need to read the Bible to the person. And uh, at the end of this, you know, she's going, you know, maybe we should do away with clinical pastoral education in favor of Christian pastoral education. <laughs> You know that you know if this is if this is you know who we are as Christian pastors, then we should be proclaiming Christ to these people. But I'm sitting there going, "What a woman seminarian said that! If a male seminarian said that, they'd probably get in trouble for it." <laughs> yeah. So um, I just thought it was I thought it was an interesting article. I was, I was wondering how many. Um, of uh, my brother pastors uh, would would sit there and go, yeah, you tell it. Um, so, but it was, a, it was an interesting, a very well done article. Impressive. Well, let's go over to the Voice of America then. Yep. We have a good segue for this one, but all right, we've we've talked about before on the show, I think, um, some of the uh, the propaganda in grade school uh, curricula in certain Middle Eastern countries, you know, um, where you'll have in a Muslim uh, country, in the public school, you know, okay, if you have you know, eight Jews and you kill three of them, how many do you have left? Or, you know, stuff like that. And, um, and, and that's the reality. I mean, that kind of stuff is, is being used in just basic curricula. And um, one of the places where this kind of stuff is being used is in Saudi Arabia. And it gets a little tricky when there is the Islamic Saudi Academy, a private school located in northern Virginia. And the school is funded by Saudi Arabia's government and the school sticks closely to curricula used in schools in Saudi Arabia. And so it's, it's not just a matter of this material being used in, in, uh, in another country, in another side of the world, it's being used right here in the United States. But the real concern of the article, beside, beyond that, is... Um just how little religious freedom and other kinds of freedoms there are in Saudi Arabia. We were just talking a moment ago about the problems with breast cancer going on over there because of these these strong taboos. Um, yep. And now, you know, uh, if you're not, a, this is, uh, it is very hard to engage in worship if you're not a Sunni Muslim that ascribes to the beliefs that the Saudi government requires. If you aren't, don't fit into that box, you're in bad shape. Yep. And instead... We've talked about this before. Yeah. 
it's, it's difficult to, um, if you want to become a Christian and you're a registered Muslim, then trying to change your official religion is extremely difficult. So, and basically, the, uh, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom is trying to push them to, to change. But, you know, it's just an observer panel. Um, it's, all they can do is say, you really ought to do this. And all they can do is suggest. So, you know, they don't really have a lot of, a lot of hope. There never was much hope. Just a fool's hope. No, they, they don't have a lot of pull at all, and it's really very frustrating, very frustrating. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. So they, uh, they asked the State Department to continue designating Saudi Arabia as a country of particular concern in the annual religious freedom report and the strength and diplomatic efforts to promote human rights and religious freedom as part of the country's bilateral relationship. Which... It's just, you know, I'm saying we don't like what you're doing. Uh, we're not really in any position to boycott them. So, uh, and of course, if we boycott them over uh, religious freedom and, and things like that, uh, there's a whole lot of countries that we'd have to do that with. So, you know, what do you do? I, I, I don't have an answer to that question. How do, how do you handle that? I work in the church and not the government. Yeah, I agree with you. I um, I don't know what to do. You know, it's, it's very frustrating, and I feel for people across the world who are oppressed in, in, in those places where there is not the freedom that we have. Citizens of the world, you are under my control. So, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> If you're listening to this or watching this, be thankful. Be very thankful. And uh, that's kind of a sad note to ever end, end, end things on, but uh, we, we pray. And the really bad thing is that all these people, they've got all the oil, you know? I, I can't figure out why God gave all the oil to all the crazy people. You know, why didn't he put it in Canada? Well, I wouldn't know about that. I haven't been in Canada in years. Canadians are nice people. <laughs> yeah, there's no crazy people in Canada. Well, that's, 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 I've never met a Canadian terrorist, you know. They're, they're, they're nice people. That's true. That's true. <sighs> yep, yep. You know what? So. Maybe you don't. Maybe you do know some crazy Canadians. Send us email. Podcast. <laughs> at- <laughs> Sorry about this. I know it's a bit silly. Podcast at crossfeednews.com. Go ahead and send it to us. <laughs> Maybe you wonder what's wrong with us tonight. Or if you're a shame Canadian. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you're really annoyed with Jim right now. <laughs> or you can call us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a toll call from Canada. <laughs> you Skype. Um, 206-350-4749. Call our voice now. Give us a piece of your mind. So, um, also want to let you know that hopefully next week we will be um, releasing uh, CrossFeed News 2.0. Uh, we, it was, actually it was about a year ago. I know. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, it was in like, August of last year, end of August, beginning of September, that we added video so that you could get the the show in both audio and video, you take the pick. And uh, we have quite a few people that are choose one or the other. And uh, but now with uh, Mac OS 10 Leopard being out, and I have it, I'm actually using it right now, but I'm using it on my iPhone. Um, and uh, so it's not capable of doing the extra features. Uh, we've got a, a new and improved opening for the show. Um, hopefully the sound will be a little bit better. Hopefully we won't have the echo. 
um, and and then switching to using a different computer official and just a little faster, and uh, we'll be able to throw in all kinds of, of new features like um, be able to put up pictures of the people that we're talking about and, uh, and things like that. So uh, the, the video people will probably notice the biggest difference. Hopefully the audio will be a little better too. Um, but if you're if you're watching the video version of the show, hopefully you'll see some real major improvements. And uh, so we can look forward to that. Yeah, he, 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 he's yeah, upgrading. Next week, hopefully. So, he's getting uh, all fancy yeah. on us, folks. Well, you know, the funny thing about this, folks, is that when we first met, I, I was the one who was ahead in the computer, not him. Don't be too proud of this technological terror. So uh, but he, he's taught me a lot. And, yeah, his first laptop came from me, if you remember that. Yeah. So I'll tell you on very good terms, as I recall, whatever you can pay, whenever you can pay. But hey, it worked out well. Some laptops before that, but they were pretty old as well. But uh, now that's that's yeah. and that's, yeah, that's, right. that's how we got to be friends is because through that. that that worked out really cool. Anyway, hey, we need a shout out to pdaperformance.com and uh, who do our hosting and all that kind of stuff. So you wonderful folks can listen to us blather on here, and we really do appreciate them. Well, kids, that's enough for one night, hey. So. We should wrap this up before we brother on anymore. Yes. Have a good week, folks. Have a wonderful Veterans Day. And make sure you do thank uh, a vet for uh, their service to our country and for the good things that they do. Um, and continue to pray for our men and women who are overseas still serving today. And uh, just pray then that uh, God will keep them safe. And uh, thank God for those who are willing to offer their into their, their lives and service to our country. Yeah, so we really appreciate it because it's because of you guys that uh, that we have the freedoms that we talked about tonight. Have a good week.